Fletcher's failures force its chief executive out the door. What will it take to fix the complex construction company? Firstly, let's deal with Fall Guy. I mean, I really don't see it that way. How much of the convention centre is my fault? But I'm the leader and I'm accountable. So you can't defy gravity. Mostly all of Fletcher Building is right. The new leader has a fabulous business, very well positioned. It'll be great to cheer from the sidelines, actually. It's Friday the 16th of February, and you're watching Markets with Madison. Fletcher Building's share price is in free fall after announcing yet another lump of multi-million dollar losses on problematic projects. It's so bad the Chief Executive Ross Taylor and Chairman Bruce Hassel have tendered their resignations. But the pair are just the latest fall guys. There was more before them. Fletcher's has become synonymous with failure. The country's biggest construction company is in the red again, making a $120 million loss in the half year, off more than $4 billion of revenue. It's been tainted by hundreds of millions of dollars in losses on legacy projects like the fire-damaged Sky City International Convention Centre, which has blown out to a bill of around $1.2 billion. Fletcher still hasn't received an insurance payout for it. It's now facing a new issue with its pipes sold in Australia. Allegations say they cause leaks in thousands of homes in Western Australia, but Fletcher's strongly disputes that. Fletcher's is a complex company. The group is made up of 25 businesses, such as residential building, concrete, and manufacturing products like jib plasterboard. But construction seems to be its killer. It's been plagued with problems for years. It lost a billion dollars between 2016 and 2018, leading then boss Mark Adamson to leave. The existing chief executive Ross Taylor is the latest man to fall on his sword, tabling his resignation alongside chairman Bruce Hassel. Ross told me his decision to leave was made with the board, not personally. He was in surprisingly good spirits as he took the time to talk at the end of a tough day. Ross Taylor, thank you for your time. Thanks, Maddie. I don't really know where to start, but I guess a good place to start is what's wrong with Fletcher Building? Because it seems no matter the cycle of the construction industry boom or bust, Fletcher's cannot manage projects right. Is there something structurally wrong at the core of Fletcher Building? So, first of all, mostly all of Fletcher Building is right. If I look at the, the broader operating businesses, excluding the legacy construction projects, they're running well. And I look at even Fletcher Construction with its new order book and the sort of work it's doing, it's well positioned, that's nicely profitable and low risk. We've had to clear in construction legacy projects though that were signed back in the 2016, 17 years, 90 projects. We're through all but one of them, the Convention Centre. And unfortunately with the Convention Centre, a very big project burned down in 2019 and it was unforecastable what we had to get through, the mould issues, the steel remediation, COVID in the middle, and a litany of other things that went on after that. It just meant that we had to invent ways of redoing it, building it, and then as we understood that, we'd forecast it, and we've just seen progressive provisions. And really, unfortunately, that's then defined the Fletcher Building accounts every six months. The good thing, though, is that we're actually now going to finish this in 2024. And with that, we retire the last legacy construction project. I understand all the complexities that I can only imagine would come with a fire damaged building, and that's why you keep finding costs in these cupboards. You just announced 180 million that you found only six months ago. There was another 150 million. Talk me through the process of how these costs are communicated, because it seems like they're just found as the time you need to report. Like, what, what's that process as to how they're found and they're brought up? Yeah, so we end up in a monthly review cycle, which I attend the reviews at the project level, but they don't, it's a very big project, as you can imagine, and you don't, they don't re-forecast every pot of money. And some things are not re-forecastable because you've got to wait till you procure something, or you've got to wait and see how things go. And I'll give you an example with the steel remediation, because it's a, it's a very good example. So what would happen if you built that, the steel in that building from, from a greenfield site, when you can build it normally, it would be 70 million. Its cost is 350 million. So what the issue there is, is that what has to happen is the steel's been damaged by fire, but the steel's behind walls. 
But when you actually expose it, and then you've got to get all the fireproofing off it, so you've got to sandblast it, and when you repaint it, you've got to put it in a hum humidity-controlled environment and encapsulate it while you paint it, otherwise it's not to specification, and then you actually move forward from there. Understanding the cost to do that in a job that complex is impossible. So what happens is you get the methodology right, you start then to do the productivity and you say, okay, that's what it looks like. You forecast it, but then you get to a completely different part and the whole productivity changes. So what ended up happening on that is we, it's never been done before. So we had to invent it. How do you do that in situ? And then you had to say, well, what's the right productivity rate? It's, and, and that's where the surprises came. And, and there's so many examples like that in that construction. So what you normally do when you estimate a project is you end up with norms. It'll be, you do it this quickly in a normal concrete slab or a steel structure, you know the norms and you just times it by the volume. But this was nothing like that. Has there ever been any internal pushback on taking provisions previously? Oh no, I mean, what the reason we end up doing it as we do it regularly is that, you know, we, we are very circumspect about that. If you, it's, we're in a continuous disclosure environment. So if we see an issue then that. The, the thing I would say though is that what you, is the balance in construction is you want to fight for targets as well because if you just sort of say do it for whatever it costs it will be whatever it costs. So, so what you're always in that balance of what's a responsible target the team can go after that has enough buffer but without giving stupid targets that aren't realistic as well and that's, that's where there's a bit of judgment in these things. How are you paying for these extra costs? Are they being funded by debt? Yes, because we've got a net debt position. So, so we've, we, we've said we want to have our leverage ratio between one to two times. We it's now at 1.8. Which is what we forecast. And, and, and the, the cap is two, is it not? No, it's not a cap. It's our preferred range. But we've said on our settings, we intend to stay within that. So as we look forward, in spite of this, we actually expect to stay within that. Does that mean that there's no headroom for extra provisions until this project is finished at the end of this no, year? No, not at all, because you can't run your business that way. We, we, we're not, and don't read that as there will be extra provisions, because- You hope there uh, won't be, I imagine. Well, I think we're through the remediation now, and we're into the, we, we're fully procured, we're into the, the, the fit out of the convention centre. So, so uh, you know, I think we're in a much better place. Um, so we always stress test your balance sheet. So as any company would do, you say, well, if the market gets materially worse from what we expect and the earnings, if you have whatever sort of provision, so you always want buffers so you don't, you're not, you, there's no tripwire in the business. So we run the business that way. Speaking of tripwires, you're hoping to get just over $100 million in an insurance payout. Are you going to get it? Oh, I actually think we've got, our claim's much higher than that. I actually think we've got very solid grounds. The thing is we can't book it because the counting test is absolutely certain or highly certain. And in the end, we've got a push and shove process to go through with our insurers. And we, I am very comfortable with the bona fides of that claim, but, but we haven't put it in our forecasts. So it's there as an opportunity. So, so I think we've approached it the right way from an accounting point of view. I don't know if you checked your share price today, but since that trading halt lifted, it is in free fall. Why should investors stick with you and Fletcher's? Look, I actually, the way I look at the business and I mentioned is our operating businesses are in good shape and we're actually managing our way through a very tough cycle in New Zealand which residential is 20% down and our profitability is solid. We're actually doing better in our performance than the market decline. When you look at the, what we've produced, our cash flow is doing what it should be doing because when the market drops, you should have less inventory and you should have cash inflows. We've seen stronger cash flows. So those things are really good. So, so what you, and what we see is as tough as it is now in the market out there, when the market turns, we are very leveraged to the upside in that market. And the other thing we've been doing is we're continuing with that growth investment, which I've talked about. So on top of that, we've got a, a number of elements and strands in there, which will put growth on top of that. So I think the business is well positioned. We're all we're so close to being through the 2024, we'll clear legacy. And the one other thing we've got to get right then is really an industry solution over in WA for the plumbing, the plumbing leaks. Yeah, on that, you seem pretty confident that Fletcher's is not going to be on the hook for those. Why not? There's a couple of things there. The, the, we've done all the testing. We put the fund in place. We put a fund in place. People won't necessarily know we did. Just so we could get to the bottom of it. Because what the thing is, you don't want to try and think about what's the solution without getting the facts. So we've had multiple tests, experts involved, and we've been in and now and done repairs that we've funded into over 500 houses. So we've got very good data. Experts have said there's no manufacturing issue, no problems with the pipes. They're actually uh, 
code compliant and we've got complete correlation now on everything we're seeing with poor installation. So, so we've got a very, very good fact base. We've given that to the Consumer Protection Department over in WA as they're going through their own investigation. What we've now got to do with that, we've got the facts. We also know how the repairs should look and we know sort of a good guess of how many will leak. So we can now sensibly start talking to government industry, look, this is the right sort of solution. We said in our results today, we think when you dimension that, it's probably about 100 million and it's probably going to take five or six years to do. So that gives you a sense. So that's what the cost to industry is. What we haven't talked about is should we, will we, and how much might we contribute to that? And that's a decision we've got to make. We've disclo disclosed that risk in our accounts, but and we're not talking about that because we've got to work through those negotiations. You said that the broader business looks pretty good, but if I look at your divisions here, building products, earnings down, distribution, earnings down, concrete, earnings down, Aussie, earnings down, resi and development, earnings down, construction, earnings down. That's every single division. What should a new leader actually focus on? So, so if we start with that. Have you, we also talked about the market was down. So, so, so residential in New Zealand down 20%. You know, we're 66% exposed to that. So, so you can't defy gravity. You know, so if there's 60, you know, if there's 20% less volume in the market, it hurts. In Australia, we've seen an 8% decline in the market. So again, that hurts. So what? So we we have to then manage the business well through that. So so yes, it's down. But as I said, we're down less than what the market background would suggest. So I think we're going pretty well in that respect. The new leader, I think, you know, if, if I think what my focus is going to be, we've got to keep running well through the cycle and we've got to make sure we get out of convention centre, get it finished, and I want to try and get an industry solution over in Perth. If I can get those couple of legacy issues done, the new leader has a fabulous business, very well positioned, and I, I think there's a real opportunity to keep driving the performance and then grow it and, and really have some fun with the business in terms of what it might be able to do because you look across our safety performance, our customer performance, our employee engagement and our sustainability, they're very strong. So you've got so much opportunity in this business. So it'll, it'll be great to cheer from the sidelines actually. You're the fall guy today. Chairman Bruce Hassel is going with you out the door. There was a fall guy before you. What do you think the solution is here for Fletcher Building. Do you think it's too complex that Fletcher has too many facets and it should be broken up? Or should you just be run by a tradie? Could perhaps a builder manage this business because they would know how to manage projects better? So, so firstly, let's deal with fall guy. I mean, I really don't see it that way. Um, I, I, we, we, as part of getting Fletcher Building where it is today, it's been about getting ownership and accountability in the business and having leaders own their businesses and own their outcomes and sometimes that's things you make mistakes on and sometimes it's things that happen that you've got to deal with and I see what I'm doing here as a really important cultural statement that you know I, I, I think there's a whole lot of issues and you know things that could say well how much of the convention center is my fault but I'm the leader and I'm accountable and and blaming externalities all the time is not on so I actually think this sets the tone and reinforces the sort of culture we we want going forward. Do you think anyone else should go with you? No, I don't. I actually, if I, and I mentioned them the team there that I, I actually think they're doing a great job. It's so complex and they've kept program and they will get it finished and get a really good result. Well, for what it's worth, I don't think the whole thing was your fault, but I respect your decision and I hope that anybody else who was part of the problems has the decency to go out the door with you. Thank you for your time, Ross. I appreciate Thanks. it. Thanks, Maddie. Always a pleasure. Always a pleasure. One thing I will say about Ross is that he has fronted up to me in person every single time. Always with a smile, no matter how tough things may get. I wish him well, but I wish the company even better. Now go put your money to work. Thanks for watching Markets with Madison, the New Zealand Herald show for interested investors. If you want to stay up to date with financial markets, click the subscribe button below and you can watch our other episodes here. Stay up to date with all the business news and numbers as they land on nzherald.co.nz.